Hello there, just before we get into today's video, why not check out a new channel from me called War of Graphics? Want to know all the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on War of Graphics. From Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa, if it's got people fighting each other, we'll cover it. There is a link below. I hope to see you over there. And now, today's video. <laughs> In 1993, just a few hundred meters over RAF Fairford, two Russian MiG-29s collided in front of nearly a quarter million horrified spectators amassed at one of the world's largest annual military air shows. While performing a particularly tricky maneuver in which the aircraft were supposed to pass dangerously close to one another, one or both aviators made slight miscalculations that resulted in an epic mid-air crash. Both aircraft erupted into fireballs and dropped like stones, but not before pilots Sergei Trezivyatsky and Alexander Beschasnov ejected. Thanks to their ejection seats, both men survived, and if some eyewitness accounts are to be believed, despite the traumatic experience, they were in such good physical condition that they engaged in a good old-fashioned fistfight as their multi-million dollar plane smoldered on the tarmac. And now, with that introduction done, the history of ejection systems. Flashback more than half a century, and of the thousands of airmen who took part in the Second World War, only 60 actually ejected from aircraft in combat situations. Many more managed to free themselves from damaged and unflyable planes, but only the Luftwaffe employed powered ejection seats in a few of their revolutionary jets. No British or American aircraft were so equipped, but Allied pilots had relatively high survival rates when they bailed out on their own. However, unlike their German counterparts who were fired or rocketed from the aircraft strapped to their seats, emergency evacuations for Allied pilots usually went a little something like this. After sustaining catastrophic damage and losing control, aviators would unclasp their seatbelts, slide or pop the canopy out of the way, and hurl themselves into the rushing wind. Most were taught to count to ten before deploying their chutes, but few really did. Then, if their chutes were deployed and they weren't strafed by enemy fighters on the way down, they descended slowly before touching down on land or in the water below. Though some died in the process, many who had been flying at speeds approaching 400 miles an hour at close to 30,000 feet, they survived not much worse for wear. Although jet aircraft were still decades away from being produced, work began on the first primitive ejection apparatus in the early 1900s. These cumbersome and impractical contraptions used everything from springs and bungee cords to volatile and unreliable propellants to get airmen away from their aircraft. None worked particularly well, and few were tested in flight, hence most never got past the concept phase. However, great advancements were made in the following decade, many of which came from an English railway engineer, tinkerer, and inventor named Everett Caltrop. Caltrop patented a number of groundbreaking parachute designs after the horror of watching close personal friend Charles Rolls of Rolls Royce fame, by the way, die in front of a stunned crowd at Bournemouth International Aviation Meeting in the summer of 1910. Ironically, Caltrop's son survived a similar incident, after which he theorized that pilots who found themselves in similar situations had decent chances of surviving, but only if they had the right parachutes and training. To this end, Caltra patented a revolutionary new ejection device that propelled pilots away from their aircraft using compressed air. But though his design was similar to those that would become standard equipment decades later, it just wasn't practical or economically feasible due largely to aircraft design of the day. Most military aircrafts in the pre-war years were small, underpowered biplanes in which pilots sat in cramped cockpits between the upper and lower wings. In addition, the weight of the newfangled ejection seat meant that performance would go from bad to worse, which would have made the aircraft relatively easy pickings for lighter and more nimble fighters. In the late 20s, however, Romanian inventor Anastase Dragomir designed the first modern ejection seat. Dubbed the catapultable cockpit, the design underwent extensive testing and would ultimately be the foundation on which many modern ejection seats would be based. The first production ejection seats were developed by Hankel and Saar during the Second World War. Like Caltrops, they were powered by compressed air, and the first aircraft in which they were installed were the Heinkel HE-280 prototypes 
in 1940. Two years later, Uncle Test pilot Helmut Schenk became the first aviator to eject in a real-world situation when his control surfaces iced up at nearly 8,000 feet (2,500 meters) during an unpowered test flight. Then, in 1944, Hankel HE-162s became the first operational jets to get new ejection seats, this time powered by explosive charges akin to giant shotgun shells. Some late-war twin-engine Dornier DO-335s also had ejection seats, though of those that did, none were ever used in combat. Meanwhile, in Sweden, arms manufacturer Bofors and aerospace conglomerate Saab were busy collaborating on a new compressed chair ejection seat for the Saab J-21, but the first emergency use wouldn't take place until 1946 after a mid-air collision during flight testing. As jets replaced piston engines in aircraft after World War II, speeds increased rapidly. But this meant that manual egress would be nearly impossible and probably deadly. In the United States, the U.S. Army Air Corps and later the Air Force tinkered with various designs, including some that propelled pilots away from the aircraft using very powerful springs. Though relatively simple and lightweight, later powered systems manufactured by Britain's Martin Baker Company would gain wider acceptance. The first ejectee to use Martin Baker devices was British aviator Bernard Lynch, who ejected from a Gloucester Medium Mark III in late July of 1946. The second was American Airman Larry Lambert on August the 17th of the same year, who volunteered to eject from a Northrop P-61B Black Widow night fighter to test the design's effectiveness. While the planes were traveling at 300 miles per hour at 6,000 feet, Lambert experienced instant acceleration to 12 Gs thanks to the 37mm cartridge that fired under his seat, and when his chute opened as planned, he drifted to the ground safely. Lambert later opined that he had lived a thousand years in less than a minute. The first emergency ejection seat use occurred in 1945 during a mishap while testing the experimental jet-powered Armstrong Whitworth AW-52 flying wing in Great Britain. But as speeds continued to climb, it became necessary to increase the size of the charge to get pilots away from their aircraft more quickly, though in many cases the ejections themselves caused debilitating head, neck, and spine injuries. As a result, rocket-propelled seats were developed, the first of which was fitted to a Convair F-102 Delta Dagger in the late 1950s. This system worked well because rockets didn't accelerate as quickly as charges, and therefore pilots weren't subject to such violent forces. Since being introduced on supersonic aircraft, nearly a dozen pilots have ejected at speeds greater than 800 miles per hour, and the highest recorded ejection in a Martin Baker seat took place in 1958 when crewmen were expelled from an unflyable Canberra bomber cruising at 57,000 feet. Then in 1966, following an accident when attempting to launch a D-21 drone from an SR-71 Blackbird to a American airman ejected at Mach 3.25, that's 2,500 miles per hour, at an altitude of 80,000 feet. Most standard ejection systems operate in two stages. First, the canopy is blown apart or jettisoned away from the aircraft intact, after which the seat and occupants are propelled through the opening. On some early units, this required two distinct actions by the aviator, but both functions were later combined into a single action to simplify the harrowing process, which was often exacerbated by injury, disorientation, and damaged components. These days, the ACES-2 ejection seat manufactured by Raytheon's Collins Aerospace Division is used in most American-built fighters and ground-attack aircraft like F-15s and A-10s. Early ACES-2 models were only equipped with overhead ejection handles, which forced pilots to assume the proper position by manually pulling down a shield to protect his or her face and oxygen mask from the resulting blast of air. Later models by Collins and other manufacturers added a secondary lower handle which permitted pilots to eject when they couldn't or didn't have time to retract the face shield due to injury or high g-forces. But though most ejection systems fire upward, some, like the ones on early F-104 Starfighters, were equipped with downward tracking seats. This was necessary on starfighters because pilots had the increased risk of slamming into the aircraft's tail, on which the horizontal stabilizers were mounted on top of the vertical stabilizer instead of at its base. Obviously, ejecting downward creates a number of problems, the most prominent of which is being rocketed into the ground or flight deck on low-altitude ejections, like those sometimes experienced during takeoffs and landings. Similarly, of the six ejection seats on most B-52 stratofortresses, two fire downward through hatches in the bottom of the fuselage, while the remaining four positions in the upper deck fire upward. 
Of course, B-52s don't have canopies like fighters, interceptors, and ground-attack aircraft. On these, the canopies can be blasted away intact or destructed with a cord of explosives embedded in the canopy itself. But aircraft designed for low-altitude applications often have ejection systems that propel crewmen directly through the canopy because there isn't sufficient time to wait for the canopy to be ejected first. When the ejection sequence is initiated, the charges shatter the canopy fractions of a second before the seat launches. This system was pioneered for VTOL aircraft that spend much of their time hovering just above the ground or carrier decks. Though generally operated manually, some systems like the one on the Soviet's Yak-38 VTOL fighter employ ejection seats that can be automatically activated by the onboard computer if it senses the aircraft is about to become uncontrollable and or crash. Further on some aircraft, ejection seats are fitted with hardened steel shell teeth that strike and shatter the canopy as the seat and its occupant are fired upward. Other aircraft over the years, like B-58 Hustlers and B-10, 70 Valkyries incorporated ejection capsules in which pilots and crew members were enclosed in individual armored shells prior to ejection, largely because these aircraft flew extremely high and fast, which meant that without them, survival would be unlikely. By comparison, the General Dynamics' F-111 used cabin ejection where both side-by-side -side seats were ejected together in a single 3,000-pound capsule. Likewise, some Rockwell B-1 bomber prototypes incorporated fully enclosed capsules for all four crew members that were about the size of a typical pickup truck and could safely land on both land and sea. In large multi-person systems like these, multiple rockets and parachutes are used, and prior to landing, large air bladders are inflated to reduce impact-related injuries. As losses mounted during the conflict in Vietnam, the US Navy and Air Force became concerned about pilots ejecting over hostile territory. Of those that did, many were captured or killed. In addition, the cost in men and machines to recover those that had evaded detection was staggering, and many more aircraft and servicemen were lost in botched rescue attempts. In the late 60s, the two services attempted to remedy the situation by jointly funding a wacky program known as Aerial Escape and Rescue Capability, or AirCap. With this revolutionary but far-fetched system, ejection seats would act as mini-aircraft that would be able to fly airmen out of harm's way until they could be picked up. Three companies submitted designs in response to the initial RFP, of which one incorporated a small gyrocopter, while another relied on semi-rigid wings that unfurled after ejection, after which flight was powered by a jet engine originally intended for use on early drones. Not surprisingly, the winged-powered prototypes resembled time travel machines from early 20th century sci-fi movies. In addition, development costs were high, operable production units seemed highly unlikely, and the contraption were so bulky and cumbersome that stuffing them into narrow fighter fuselages just wasn't practical. And with the end of the Vietnam War, the project was quietly dropped. <laughs> Though building injection systems for high-speed, high-altitude aircraft has always been a priority, during the 60s more emphasis was placed on producing units capable of operating in zero-zero applications as well. This capability, which stands for zero altitude and zero airspeed, was developed to help air crews escape during emergencies in which their aircraft hadn't yet left the ground or was flying at low speed and altitude. Thus, prior to the introduction of zero-zero units, ejections could only be performed above minimum altitudes and airspeeds. Zero-zero systems generally use a combination of charge charges and rockets as propellants, after which additional charges deploy the parachute. One of the most successful 00 systems of all time is the Martin Baker H-7, which has been used in a variety of aircraft, including F-4 Phantoms. With nearly 11,000 built, H-7s are among the world's most mass-produced ejection systems. They can be deployed at more than 50,000 feet, at speeds approaching 700 miles per hour, and in 00 emergencies. Martin Baker claims that this model alone has saved over 2,400 lives, and of those manufactured, about 1,000 500 are still in service. Currently, an additional 5,500 of the company's MK-10 seats are in use, and according to the company's website, they've saved an additional 800 lives. There's an old joke in aviation circles that ejecting from helicopters isn't a big deal, it's passing through the rotors, or where things get dicey. That said, most helicopters don't have ejection seats for this very reason, but Russia's Kamov Ka-50 
is one notable exception. When the Scout and Attack helicopter entered service in 1995, it was the first and only machine of its kind to incorporate an ejection seat. The system itself is similar to those found on traditional fixed-wing aircraft, but before the pilot is ejected, the rotors are blown off by explosive bolts, clearing the way for safe egress. Likewise, the Soviet Tupolev Tu-144 Concorde was the only commercial airliner ever fitted with ejection seats, though it's worth noting that they were only available for crew members and not passengers. But though the system had merits, it was scrapped on all but a few aircraft because perhaps ejecting from an aircraft full of hapless air travelers about to meet their makers is in, well, just really bad taste. So I really hope you found today's video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And thanks for watching.